We'll be looking today at Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. This is a continuation of the numerous parables that Jesus has been uh, teaching and giving, and now we come to two little parables that parallel each other in, in many ways, but they have certain nuances and differences as well. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. I wonder if one of you would be willing to read the passage Read it strongly and boldly and loudly and well, so maybe it'll be picked up here on the recording. Anyone? Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Whatever translation you have. Read my translation. By all means. Yes, sir. That perfectly fine. Unless it changes one of my points, in which case, <laughs> go ahead, Dale, you're good. The parable, the kingdom of heaven is like Israel. Wait, what version are you reading? <laughs> You're good. Go ahead. Uh, I wrote these in. But oh, okay. Let me go ahead and read from the original and I'll be okay. I, I got you. I, okay, good. Kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. That's great. What a, what a beautiful passage. Well, let's unpack this a little bit. I just have two points I want to make about it, and then we'll have some good discussion about it as well. I was thinking about uh, treasures and fields. Um, Ronnie and I are big movie people. Probably a lot of you are movie people as well. Maybe you're not. We like movies. But uh, I immediately thought, you know, just off the top of my head, Treasures in fields. Denny, you probably have some as well in this. I thought um, Fargo, No Country for Old Men, and Shawshank Redemption. In the Shawshank Redemption, Andy tells Red, Tim Robbins' character tells Morgan Freeman's character, that a treasure is hidden under a certain tree in a field in uh, Buxton is the name of the town. In um, No Country for Old Men, Llewellyn finds a treasure, so to speak, in a field. He uh, comes upon a crime scene and traces it and finds a, uh, a briefcase full of money in a field under a tree. And then in Fargo, you might remember that Steve Buscemi's character buries a, uh, a briefcase full of cash in a snowy field. For movie nerds, you will be interested to know that both Fargo and No Country for Old Men were directed by the Coen brothers. And if you look closely at the briefcase in Fargo and No Country for Old Men, it is extremely possible that, that is the exact same briefcase. A lot of people talk about that very, very similar style. Anyway, it's, it's almost, you, you might say, it's just a very, very common thing. What's interesting about those three examples in terms of movies is that of the three examples there, two of the treasures found in fields lead to both result from and lead to crime, violence, and not good things. In No Country for Old Men, for instance, the suitcase of money, briefcase, I need to think through those terms. I'm not good at that. The, the bag full of money is... Um, a briefcase is what you carry to like an office and a suitcase is what you put clothes in. So it's like a big briefcase, it's, but it's big. Uh, the briefcase full of money is, is just cursed. I mean, it's a symbol almost of man's, you know, greed and violence and, and violence follows it. Um, so too with Fargo. But in Shawshank Redemption, it's the one movie where the treasure in the field that is hidden in the field and then uncovered is a beautiful treasure that leads to joy, happiness at the end of Shawshank Redemption. It gets Morgan Freeman where he needs to go, and uh, it's a positive thing. Apparently, stories about treasures, hidden treasures, have been universal and pretty pervasive in numerous cultures. It was so 2,000 years ago in Palestine. The Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds commentary says, treasures were often hidden in fields because there were no formal banks as we know them today. Then it says this, the intriguing copper scroll found at Qumran. That's the Qumran is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Qumran was a very extreme, uh, the Essenes were a very extreme 
um, ascetic group among the Jews who lived at Qumran. But the Copper Scroll lists 64 places in Palestine where treasures were supposed to be hidden. Here's an example. I want you all to write this down. So, Dale, if you go back there, you can take the Copper Scroll and you can find this treasure. Here's where they tell you to go. In the ruin, which is in the valley, pass under the steps leading to the east, 40 cubits. There is a chest of money and its total weight, the weight of 17 talents. Now, I'm sure that after 2,000 years, that money is sitting right there. What's crazy is it actually might, might be. So these were pervasive stories. And it's pretty commonly acknowledged that when Jesus tells the story of, of the treasure in the field and of the pearl of great price, that both of these stories were known among the Jews of that time. They were not unusual stories. Now, what Jesus does is he takes them and he gives them kingdom meaning. But it's like taking a common story in a culture and giving it Christian significance. So I just want to make two points in particular. The first point is this. Both of the parables illustrate that the kingdom of heaven is an immeasurable treasure. The kingdom of heaven is an immeasurable treasure. Let's just look at that aspect of the two. Look at verses 44 and then 45 and 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Then verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search. And then in 45 and 46, we have two statements about the pearl. A merchant, a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, pearl of great price. So the first thing that's obvious is that the kingdom of heaven is profoundly valuable. It is a treasure. It matters. Craig Keener, who does a lot of work on the background of stories in the New Testament, he wrote that 2,000 years ago, divers sought pearls in the Red Sea the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean, and some pearls at that time could be worth the equivalent in our day of millions of dollars. Another commentator said some pearls valued at what we would value today is something like $10 million, meaning if you found a pearl of great price in the ancient world, I mean, that was just, that was winning the lottery. What, one of the things that's really powerful is to recognize how often the New Testament speaks of the gospel and of Jesus and of the kingdom as in terms of treasure and riches and wealth, like kingdom wealth. Let me just give you a few examples of this. And, and by the way, these are just a few examples. I, I passed over certainly just as many examples that I'm not including. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 10. Romans 10, 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. So in Paul's teaching in Romans 10, 12, when we call on the name of Christ, we receive the riches of the kingdom of heaven, and God bestows those riches. In Ephesians 3, 8, Paul writes, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. This is what was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I love the little nuance there, the adjective unsearchable. I mean, just astonishing riches of Christ. In Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And what's interesting when you look at particularly the word riches in the New Testament in terms of like not, it's oftentimes contrasted with mammon, like earthly riches. Oftentimes in, in verses or in sections, you have like, you know, the, the riches that, that lead to death and the riches of the kingdom that are life. But oftentimes it's connected to glory, riches. So this would be an example in Philippians 4.19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And then Colossians 1, 27. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory 
of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is oftentimes referred to as the mystery. You might think of the last sermon in Revelation. But to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And then one more, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Here is one of the ways that the New Testament draws a contrast between earthly wealth and kingdom riches and wealth. So listen to this. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. He does not here condemn them for riches. He condemns them for the haughtiness that sometimes comes with riches. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. So twice their riches is used, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So there's a clear contrast. Hey, if, if you grow haughty with the riches of the earth, you, you can miss the kingdom completely. And also your treasure will fade. Jesus talks about this, of course, where moth and rust destroys, you know, but the riches of the kingdom, God provides us with it. So the one thing that's very abundantly clear is that the kingdom of heaven is profoundly valuable and it is so valuable that even though the world despises it, by world, I mean like the fallen world order, it is the most valuable thing in the world. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That, that whole dynamic of the world devalues the only thing that really has value, which is the kingdom and the gospel and Christ Jesus and his cross. And that is an awesome thing to ponder that true riches, what is of most value, is overlooked. I love the stories. You hear them almost, almost every other year. You hear a story about someone at a garage sale who buys a painting, you know, two, three dollars. And then usually they, they open up the back of it. Sometimes the painting itself, you know, ends up being like an original Renoir or something, and then it's sold at auction for $2.7 million, something crazy. That has not been my experience, by the way, in the limited time I've been at uh, those things. But if any of you uh, do happen upon that, uh, be sure to give it to the building program. <laughs> Just kidding. Look for the building program for the stewardship team over there. <laughs> yeah. But, but oftentimes the treasure's hidden. So, like a lot of times you buy the painting they'll cut open the back of it and it's like layered in there. And then it's just unbelievable. The kingdom of heaven is valuable. I just want to say that to us. You, you are not wasting your time with things that don't matter when you pursue Christ. Christ is of inestimable value. It is immeasurable. And the second thing I want to say is this, the kingdom of heaven is worth the reorientation of our entire lives. Here I'm talking about what the people give up to get these treasures in the two parables. The kingdom of heaven is worth the reorientation of our entire lives. So notice this. The kingdom of heaven, go back to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Now, lots of people, I think this is because people have too much time on their hands personally, but lots of people struggle with the ethics of that. Well, if he found it in the field, wouldn't it belong to the guy who owns the field? You can't press parables that far. I mean, the point is the treasure and him giving up everything he has to have it. It reminds me of... I literally, I'm not joking. In, in a, one of William Lane Craig's debates with an atheist, the guy pointed out that Jesus technically committed a crime by instructing his disciples to go and get the horse for the triumphal entry. Go find this horse and take it. I've always thought that was the most insane thing I have ever heard in my life, by the way. But people can find what they want to find. No, the point is the treasure is in the field. The man finds it and covers it up. There is a parallel, by the way, I can't help but say this because I thought about it the other day. 
I gave Bells, and any, those of you with dogs know exactly where I'm going. I gave her a treat, a little dog bone. She immediately went to the uh, sofa and started pressing down. What was she trying to do? Trying to hide it. She wants to bury that bone. She'll come back to that later. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The kingdom of heaven again is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, one kind of interesting distinction between the two is that the guy who finds the treasure in the field, it sounds like he came upon it. The merchant is intentionally looking. This may be reading too much into it too, but there are those who suggest that Jesus is trying to cover the various types of people, those who do not know they need salvation and those who are seeking it, what we would call today seekers, people who are looking and then those who stumble upon it, that the kingdom of God comes upon us in different ways and at different points in our lives. But notice the commonality. The man who finds the treasure in the field, he covers it up and then in his joy, he sells all that he has and buys the field. This much we do know from the law at that time. If you purchase the field, you are the rightful owner of anything in it, of everything in it. The other guy, the merchant, he finds one pearl of great value, which is interesting because that's a new note of exclusivity. The kingdom is one thing. Christ is one, you know? I mean, we come to the one great valuable thing in life that we're willing to give up everything for. Who on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. So the kingdom is valuable and it's valuable enough for us to reorient our entire lives. That is to sell everything we have to get it. Um, many people have pointed out that there's a beautiful note of grace and discipleship here. Grace, we didn't make the treasure. It was either put in our path or offered to us. Discipleship, we give up everything we have to get it. Soren Kierkegaard was a Danish um, philosopher, and he was also a Lutheran Christian. And he wrote a book called Attack Upon Christendom, which is one of the most blistering things I have ever read. It was a series of newspaper articles in the Danish press attacking the wealth and pomp and laxity of the state Lutheran churches. So, so Kierkegaard was saying, our churches are too comfortable, our ministers are too whatever. He's constantly mocking ministers for their flowing robes and all that. I love Kierkegaard. If you wanna read biting sarcasm from a couple few hundred years ago, read that. It's really fantastic if you're wired that way. If you don't like that, then don't read that because that's pretty much all it is. He says this. He says, Kierkegaard wrote, this, in my opinion, is the falsification of which official Christianity is guilty. Official Christianity does not frankly and unreservedly make known the Christian requirement, by which he meant sell all that you have to obtain the kingdom. Meaning what he was saying was our churches don't ever tell people it may cost you to come to Christ. You may have to give something up to come to Christ. You may have to lay down your life. He calls that the Christian requirement. And then he says, perhaps because it is afraid people would shudder to see at what a distance from it we are living, meaning we're comfortable Christians. This idea of selling everything we have because the kingdom is so very valuable, would strike many Christians as extreme. But the kingdom has not lost its value. We just have become disoriented. I think maybe my favorite statement on this comes from Calvin Miller. I'd like to read this to you and then we'll conclude and have our discussion. But Calvin Miller wrote a little poem about comfortable Christianity that I've just thought for years was a powerful statement. He said this, 
I'm just a cash card saint in celluloid. Can I afford to call this Jesus King? I'd like to follow him and yet avoid cross-lugging and a naked death. I sing, therefore, to harmonize and think of all I'll eat when singing's over with. Born twice by hundreds, we gather at the mall and bless the church or clap or criticize. Listen to this. Grace by installment, total faith, and we can spot a bargain when there's one in town. The maximum of everything that's free with nothing but the minimum paid down. Last two lines. It makes his love so interest-free, not hard, like taking up your cross by MasterCard. <laughs> I mean, what a statement. Taking up your cross. I miss Calvin Miller, by the way. He passed away, and uh, that, that's a very Calvin Miller thing to say. It's like taking up your cross by MasterCard. I'd like the benefit of it now, and I'd like to just pay over time or pay not at all or pay later. You don't get to take up your cross by MasterCard. Sometimes it requires laying down your life. So there's a lot more here. It's a beautiful two little parables. But here's what I want to propose to you, that the kingdom of heaven is an immeasurable treasure and that the kingdom of heaven is worth the reorientation of our lives. God offers it to us out of his grace. We receive it by faith. This is not a statement about works righteousness, but it is a statement about allowing the value of the kingdom to reorient our lives, to be willing to lay down everything we have, to have it because it's so valuable.